computer. Okay, so we learned when we were making alkenes, we have to follow three rules. One rule is called the Hoffman rule. That means it makes the less stable one because it uses a big base. There was one on each of the quizzes. Then we have the other rule, Zaitsev's rule, which says you make the most stable if you have a small base. That was on both quizzes. And then you have conjugation. That's the third rule we use for that. And that one wasn't on there, but we're gonna talk a little more about that today as well. Okay, so when we talked about these cyclohexanes, we said, if you can, you always have to have your leaving group in an axial position and a hydrogen in an axial position. Wherever those two things line up, so that they're anti periplanar to each other, that's where the double bond's gonna form. You can't form it anywhere else, okay? So that's what we talked about when we got here. So we want our leaving group in the axial uh, side, and then no matter where that other axial hydrogen is, that's where you're gonna form that bond, okay? So now let's talk about those consecutive reactions on, um, let's see, yes, that's where we were. All right, so let's talk about those consecutive reactions here. So the thing that's happening for us is we're having conjugation here. And so what's gonna happen is on our, on our, uh, this side right here, we're gonna remove one of the chlorines and a hydrogen there. And it, because there is no other double bond, is gonna follow Zaitsev's rule, okay? So it's gonna give us the most, uh, stable tri-substituted alkene it can. Okay, so now once we have that happening, now we have the option of having this beta hydrogen uh, come off right here. And if it got that beta hydrogen, that would be the more thermodynamically stable. It's gonna be the tri-substituted one. But if it takes off this proton here, it's going to be conjugated. So what we're gonna see here actually is this right here, this hydrogen here is an allele hydrogen. Now, when we talked about the allele group, we talked about that is gonna be one carbon off a double bond and those undergo substitution reactions much faster than even a tertiary, I mean, a primary carbocation, a, bah, a primary alkyl halide because they have conjugation, okay? So what's gonna happen here is it's going to pull off this one here, even though it doesn't give the more stable one, but the conjugation is actually thermodynamically more stable than having two of the isolated ones. So we're gonna end up with this conjugated one here and as the major product. You will get a little bit of the other product, but the major product will do, uh, will be from that, okay? So the, Conjugated diene is more stable than that isolated diene because of the isolated dienes because of conjugation. So that's, it, it actually does form the more stable. It's just, it doesn't look like it's forming the more stable. It's forming the conjugated one, which is more stable than the two independent uh, out, uh, double bonds. <clears throat> okay. So now let's look at that mechanism in a little more detail. The first side of course goes um, as, it would normally, giving us our Zaitsev rule here. We're gonna have our base come in, abstract this hydrogen, kicking out our chloride here, giving us our double bond right here. And this is of course an E2 mechanism right here. And now we have a choice. On this side, we can either take the one that's the vicinal hydrogen here, or we can take the one that is the uh, tertiary hydrogen, beta hydrogen over here. Now, we would think by Zaitsev's rule, we should do it in this direction here, following the getting the B product here. But notice that this double bond is isolated from this double bond, okay? Now, if we take this hydrogen here, this uh, one here, what we're gonna end up with is conjugation. And remember that is these right here, we have these P orbitals overlapping across four atoms, making it even more stable than having the isolated pi orbital here, isolated from this p orbital here because there's no p orbital on this center atom. So that's why the conjugated rule works is because it actually does end up giving it a more thermodynamically stable system. Okay, questions on that? All right, 
So now let's do another consecutive one. Instead of having the halogens being three, uh, one and three apart, having a whole uh, CH2 group apart, let's put them on the same atom. Okay, when we have two halogens on the same atom, we call that geminal, meaning twin, twin dihalide. Okay, so in this case here, we have both of those hydrogens on, on both of those bromines over there, and we have two hydrogens on an alpha car on the beta carbon. Okay, now if we were to take a very strong base, in this case it's amide, usually it's sodium amide right here, and we were to remove the first thing of HBr, one here and one here, we're going to get a double bond. Okay, but what if we use that same strong base and remove the other equivalent of HBr? we're gonna get another pi bond, which gives us our triple bond. So this is how we make alkynes. We have to get a dihalo compound and remove one to give us the first double bond and remove the second uh, equivalent of HBr to give us our second double bond. So that's how we have those three bonds between carbon. Remember the first one is a sigma bond. Okay, but they don't have to be on the same one. They can actually be uh, next to each other. Next to each other is called vicinal, vicinal dihalide, okay? And in that case here, we're gonna take one from the hydrogen from this side and the chlorine from this side. And then on the second equivalent, we're gonna take the chlorine from this side and the hydrogen from this side, giving us our triple bond, okay? So we've gone from making double bonds to making triple bonds. We just have to have the right amount of the halogens to do it. So these are all called the dehydrohalogenation reactions, which D means remove hydrohalogenation is a hydroic acid, okay? So, we're just doing the same thing, we're just doing it twice. Okay, so that is uh, the last of that reaction. And so, so in summary, our E2 mechanism is analogous to our SN2 mechanism, one step, second order, because the base and the substrate have to be there at the exact same time, okay? Uh, the tertiary halides react faster than the secondary halides, and the secondary halides react faster than the primary halides. And this is counterintuitive, but the idea is that your bond is easier to break on that tertiary carbon as you're starting to pull the hydrogen off. It's easier to break the carbon halogen bond on that tertiary site. So because of that, we have the tertiary being faster than the secondary. And this is favored for all strong bases, okay? It can be a big bulky base or it can be a little base. Look at that table you have. Almost all of those reactions are E2. The only one that's E1 is when you have a poor base, like water or methanol, okay? So you have strong bases will do that, big or small. The leading group, the better the leading group, the faster the reaction. So bromines faster than chlorine. And it's favored in polar aprotic solvents. Remember, you need polar protic solvents to have carbocations. So if you don't want to form a carbocation, you do it in a polar protic, aprotic solvent so that you don't form that carbocation. So our E2s are faster in polar aprotic compounds. Okay. The other thing we found out was the E2 is regio and stereo select. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is kind of like a basic question, but as I was, there's like a lot of rules we're doing here. So I want to make sure I understand the basis. Uh -huh. Is like when we, when we were talking about, I noticed that like the elimination reactions are about strong bases, and substitutions are about strong nucleophiles. Correct. So just so I know, I remember this correctly, why is it that when you get to chlorine, as a stronger base. No, it, okay, because it was a weaker acid. The strongest acid is HI. The weakest acid on that column is HF. Therefore, a fluoride ion is the weaker, is the stronger base. So is it, but is it base mean like the ability to um, donate your, your electrons? It's the ability of using your electrons to grab onto a hydrogen. Okay. So uh, what, the way to look at this is that, okay, so the pK of HF is like 3.5. So it's not even a strong acid and therefore it's gonna make a stronger base. Okay, but uh, we don't typically use fluoride as a base. We use it as a nucleophile. 
because it's small and has a nice charge. So it's more likely to be used as a nucleophile than as a base. When we talk about bases, we want to think about thermodynamic bases, which are things with oxygen negative charges. Yeah, I'm just trying to yeah. get it. So when you think base, think oxygen with a negative charge. That's hydroxide, alkoxide, t-butoxide, okay? okay? Uh, all, the rest of them are gonna be nucleophiles, okay? Now the weak bases would be things like water and methanol because they're analogous to the charged ones. They just don't have the charge, okay? All right, that's a good delineation actually to have. Okay, we found out that they're regioselective, meaning that you wanna put them in the right place, Zaitsev's rule, Hoffman rule. And stereoselective by having your hydrogen and your leaving group anti to each other, that tells you which side the groups are going to be on. Okay. And you're always favored, if possible, to have, if you have a choice between the cis and trans isomer, you're going to get the trans isomer because of stereo bulk. But if you only have one hydrogen, then you might have to go for the cis isomer because that's the only option you have. Okay. So um, SN2s uh, compete with E2 reactions with your tiny bases, you, with your hydroxide and your methoxide, because they're small and they're still nucleophilic enough. But once your bases get bigger, that, that competition goes away. E2 reactions don't undergo rearrangements, carbocation rearrangements. That's a great thing. You, you're not going to scramble your system up. And the E2 reactions of alkyl halides are much more useful than E1 reactions because the E1 is gonna give you a competition with SN1, E1, and so you're gonna have elimination products, substitution products, and you're going to have your carbocation move around. So you can end up with like 10 products from just the one reaction where you're only gonna get one product from the E2 reaction, maybe two. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so now that that's a detailed summary of E2, let's go to E1 and just kind of compare the differences there. Because E1 goes through the carbocation, uh, we actually end up, it usually follows Zaitsev's rule because it doesn't matter if it's a big base or a small base. Because we've already broken the bond, we've already made the carbocation. So we don't have a Hoffman rule when it comes into this one because the carbocation is the driving factor. And the carbocation is the slow step too, okay? So in this case here, we're gonna make our major product is gonna be our Zaitsev rule, the more substituted. Our minor product is gonna be the less substituted rule. And so, and like before, the bigger the leaving group, the longer that bond is, the more reactive it is, the easier it is to break, okay? So think the bigger, longer bond is the weaker bond. The weaker bond is easier to break. So the alkyl halide that has iodine on it is gonna go much faster than the alkyl halide with chlorine on it, okay. And so that means that of course, the tertiary reaction, secondary and tertiary are gonna be much faster than the primary and the methyl. In fact, the primary and methyl don't happen, don't do E1 at all. You look at the table, they don't do E1 at all. They have no reaction, okay. But the secondaries can go, just they're gonna be slower than the tertiaries. And that follows carbocation stability, just like in SN1. If you form a carbocation, your tertiary is gonna be the fastest. Okay, so, but of course, whenever we form a carbocation, we have to worry about uh, carbocation movement. And in both of these cases, we're actually having carbocation movement to give us the conjugated product. So I'm actually showing you when conjugated products will actually form in there. So let's look at this first one here. So we have to always look for the, con once we have, if we have a double bond on here already, <clears throat> if we have a double bond on here already, we have to think conjugation, okay? So when we go and you know, look at this and say, well, look, th this, this is kind of far away. I'll, I'm gonna be forming my carbocation here. So that means we're gonna be forming our carbocation here. But <clears throat> what's the stability of a secondary carbocation? Yeah, barely, tertiary is better. What's better than a tertiary carbocation? The vinylic or the, I'm sorry, the allylic or benzylic? 
Allylic is one carbon away from a double bond. Benzylic is one carbon away from a benzene ring, which means we're going to do a one, two hydride shift and move our, our, our carbocation here. It looks like a secondary carbocation, but it's next to a double bond. Why is that important? Well, you have a lone, you have these p orbitals here, and what's the carbocation? But an empty p orbital. Those p orbitals can overlap. That makes it more stable. And now that it's more stable, it can then have. That means that it can transfer to this secondary allylic cation, and then they were going to remove a proton from over here and give us our conjugated diene. Okay, so E1, the reason it goes through the conjugation is because it's going to do a shift to give us the allylic or benzylic carbocation. In the other one, it was just going to give us the more stable diene, the conjugated diene. Okay. So let's do that with benzene too here. So in the case of benzene here, oh, look, we have two methyl groups. So we can't even make a double bond here. We can only make a double bond here. But if we did it by E2 mechanism, we would form the double bond way out here. But if we do it with an E1 mechanism, we're going to form a carbocation right here. And that's a secondary carbocation. But if it does a 1-2 methyl shift, shift this over here, it's going to make a tertiary benzylic carbocation. I think that's the happiest carbocation in the world. It's in conjugation. It's got all the carbons around it in the world. It's got its empty orbital overlapping with a whole bunch of benzene orbitals. You know, that, that, it, it's probably got a smile on its face right now. Okay, so, so we did a one, two methyl shift and it made the happiest uh, cation in the world. And then of course, we can lose this proton that was on that carbon there. And we get, not only that, we get our most substituted product here. We have four, we get the, the four uh, substituted alkene, four times substituted alkene. So, okay. So when we have our SN, I'm sorry, our E1 and conjugation, you're doing it because of the stability of the cation when it shifts over one. You're only going to shift over one slot to make that more stable cation, in this case, the allylic and benzylic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about stereochemistry or stereoselectivity. Um, <clears throat> so when you form that carbocation, you are now going to an sp2 hybridized orbital, right? So you're gonna stick your groups out and they're all gonna be in the same plane, okay? So when you do that, <clears throat> you're going to have to figure out where the big groups are gonna go, okay? And so most of the time, what you're gonna see is the big groups, once you form your carbocation right here, this big group and this big group are trying to try to be as far away from each other as possible. And that's gonna give us a predominantly E configuration, opposite configuration, remember E is opposite. So you're gonna get your majority product being your E product, but you are gonna get some Z product because this it has free rotation around here. It can rotate, okay. So you typically get E for that. Now, what, what kind of helps us think about removing this hydrogen here is the fact that <clears throat> we have this empty P orbital here and we already had hyperconjugation to those electrons. Okay, which makes this pro hydrogen more acidic. So it's actually once we form that carbocation and once it overlaps with this uh, sigma bond, it makes it easy to remove this hydrogen and form that pi bond by adding both of those electrons from that sigma bond into our pi bond. Okay, so it is stereoselective and predominantly gives us E products. Okay, now when you have a uh, ring, we said before, if you do an E2 reaction, your halogen has to be axial and a hydrogen has to be axial to be able to do the elimination. That's not true because we've changed our mechanism. We're changing our system and we're going from an sp3 hybridized orbital to a flat sp2 trigonal planar. And so it doesn't matter. You can actually have it removed and still form your Product. And in this case, it's going to form right here because it gives us the most substituted product. Okay. Under 
those under E2 conditions, it wouldn't have reacted in that position. And it wouldn't have reacted because when you flipped it the other way, the chlorine becomes axial, but the methyl group over there becomes equatorial. And so that means you have to build your double bond over here. So our double bond would have been over here. <clears throat> so we wouldn't have gotten this product through the E2 mechanism. All right, so then if we also have to worry about carbocation rearrangement. So here we have a secondary alkyl halide right here. When it leaves, we have the secondary carbocation, but gosh, you know, there's really, this would be, a, if I move this hydrogen over, I would get a tertiary carbocation. And guess what? When I do that, I end up with the same product as I would have gotten if I had done it with a different compound on that other app. Same product, but different starting material, all because of the formation of a carbocation first, finding its most stable arrangement, and then losing a proton to make the most substituted alkene. It's following all the rules, okay? Okay, so in summary, because we form that carbocation, and carbocation is a slow step, it's a first order reaction, okay? The mechanism is a total of two steps. We make the carbocation and the carbocation reacts, okay? And like before, because of the stability of the carbocation, tertiaries react faster than secondaries, which react faster than primaries. That follows with carbocation stability. Um, favored by weaker bases, such as water and methanol or alcohols, okay? We don't want the base to be there to pull off the hydrogen at the same time. So we want to use something that's a weak base that won't act as a base until we form the carbocation. Okay. And then the leaving group, the better the leaving group, the better the reaction. That's for all of them. Iodine is always better than uh, the other ones because that long polarizable bond. And then polar protic solvents solvate those ionic materials. Remember the hydrogen bonding will solvate the negative charge. The uh, Lone pairs on the water will solvate the cation. And so by solvating that, that's why your protic solvent help form your carbocations. In fact, they're almost re they're required for your carbocation formation. And that's what we have. Um, we have a stereo regio selective um, reaction right here, and it's stereo selective too. So we need to make sure that we're looking at how we do that. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. So because we form that carbocation, SN1 and E1 compete. And so they're really messy reactions. Uh, E1s often undergo uh, carbocation rearrangements, makes it even messier reaction. Uh, and it's much, much easier to use an E2 reaction with a strong base than to use an E1 reaction because of all these detriments. So we try to use the E2 mechanism whenever possible. So we just have to use a stronger base. Unless you're super clever and you want the rearrangement to happen. But, okay. So let's compare E1 and E2. E2, if the hydrogen, if the carbon from which the hydrogen is removed is bonded to two hydrogens, meaning you have two choices, you have the ability to have the groups on the same side or on opposite sides because you have two hydrogens, you are gonna get mostly E, but some Z. Mostly opposite, but some on the same side because there is a second hydrogen where you can get that anti-periplanar alignment, okay? But if there's only one, you're gonna get whatever you got, okay? If there's only one, you've gotta move that hydrogen to be anti-periplanar with your uh, group and whether the two groups are on the same side or the two groups are on the opposite side, it doesn't matter. It's wherever you had to rotate it to get that anti periplanar, is meaning you're going to get mostly E for that isomer or mostly Z for that isomer. Okay, it all has to do with that. So if you have two hydrogens on there, just go for your E. If you have one hydrogen on there, you got to go for that Fisher projection to figure out which side they're going to be on. Okay, but in E1, it's mostly E because it's a carbocation, it's gonna approach the least hindered side and pull off the base. Okay. So in stereochemistry, 
SN1 gives racemization. Remember what racemization is? You know, you get both R and S. With SN2, you get inversion only. So you mix up everything, and here you only get one. In E1, you get mostly E. Uh, in E2, it's mostly E unless you have that anti-confirmation required to yield that Z. Typically, if you only have one hydrogen, you have to look. Questions on that? Okay. So, um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so when it says this is the from does that mean total? Here, here's what it means. Okay, it means that your beta carbon, yeah. your beta carbon here, if your beta carbon has two hydrogens on it, you're going to get mostly E. And you take the hydrogen from right. there. Right, so one of these hydrogens goes. Okay. One of these hydrogens is going to give the E, and one of them is going to give the Z. Okay. But it's going to get in the position to give the E most of the time. But Let's say we got rid of that and had a different one. We had Br with CH3 and H and CH3, okay? There's only one hydrogen to leave. And so you gotta twist it around until it is anti ferry planar to get it to leave. That's why you get stuck with whatever it is. Okay. And that's why you only have to worry about it on one hydrogen. Here on, on two hydrogens, one gives E, one gives Z. Okay, good question. Right. And that clock is very long. Oh my God. <laughs> it says it's 154. Yeah, I'm about to give the quiz again. No, okay. So let's compare and contrast. Okay. E2 is much more useful. E2 uses nice, strong bases like hydroxide, ethoxide, and t-butoxide. Okay. The reaction occurs in all of them primary, secondary, and tertiary with tertiary being fastest, secondary being second, and primary being last, okay? E1 is much less useful because there's competition and rearrangements, but if the only reagent on your reagent line is water or methanol or occasionally acetic acid, you're, you, that's, not, that's not a good thing. That's gonna be an E1 reaction. And the mechanism does not occur on primaries. So it only does it on secondaries and tertiaries. So if you have a primary, you have to go with your stronger base and go E1. Okay. okay, so let's take roll. Change gears a little bit. Just email. All right, so now we're gonna change gears. So everything we've done up to now has been the dehydrohalogenation, okay? So we can remove one to make an alkene, we can remove two equivalents to make an alkyne, right? But there's another way to do this, and we can do that with an alcohol, but it's going to be using a completely different mechanism, okay? So let's talk about that. When we're talking about the dehydration, <clears throat> that means to remove water, so we're going to remove an OH from one side, the alcohol functionality, and a hydrogen from an alpha carbon, a beta carbon. That beta carbon has to have a hydrogen. So what we'll see here is that we're going to have our alcohol, whatever thing our out, whatever designation our alcohol is, is going to make it easier or harder to remove. Okay. But the first step is to use acid. So we're going to use acid catalyzed dehydration. So if we take a primary, and we're going to add a concentrated sulfuric to it, we have to heat it to over 180 degrees. We're forcing it to go E2, okay? We're forcing it to go E2. But hold it, where's the base? Well, once you protonate your alcohol, you now have a conjugate base. So that's where our base comes in from remove the proton in our E2. But we're using our acids to protonate the alcohol first. In the case of secondaries and tertiaries, 
they go by E1, okay? But we, again, we're gonna do protonate the OH first, and then that OH is gonna leave as neutral water, leaving your carbocation. So that's why it's gonna go. So that means that we're gonna form carbocations in these two. So they're E1s, and then we're not gonna form a carbocation in this one, meaning it's E2. Okay, so let's look at the mechanism of the first two. So I said there are five things in a mechanism. Add a proton, take a proton away, reaction between a nucleophile and electrophile, rearrangement, and breaking a bond to form a stable molecular ion. The only five things that can happen in a molecule. Okay, it's on the canvas side. Go look. Anyway, uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use our hydronium ion here, and we're going to use the lone pair on the alcohol oxygen as our base, and it's going to create our new bond with hydrogen here, leaving these electrons on the water, meaning we have neutral water, and this oxonium cation. Okay. So we've protonated our water, our alcohol acted like a base, okay? So now what we can do is in the secondary and tertiary, we can break this bond and spit out neutral water to generate a carbocation. And in this case, it's a tertiary carbocation. So neutral water to split out a carbocation. Wow, that's great. And it's already in a protic solvent. So it's happy, okay? So now what happens is we have to have something act as a base. So in this case up here, we had the alcohol act as a base. Now we're gonna have that water that you just spit out act as a base to create that new bond. And these electrons kick in to form our double bond here. And then we're left with our hydronium ion. Okay, that's cool because we started with the hydronium ion and we ended with hydronium ion. This gets to come back around. So that's why it's acid catalyzed. It regenerates the catalyst at the end of the reaction mechanism. Okay, so this is what happens for primaries and secondaries and tertiaries because it can form stable secondary and tertiary carbocations. Okay, what happens in primaries though? Well, in primaries, I kind of gave it away. I said it was going to go a different mechanism. So in this case here, we're going to start the same way. We're going to add a proton. Our alcohol is going to act as our base to generate our oxonium cation here, right here. And because we can't form that carbocation, it can't leave. It's stuck there, okay? But what did we just do? We just created a conjugate base, okay? And we can use this conjugate base to remove a proton here and regenerate our acid and spit out water and form our alkene. Okay. So the first step is a fast step. Protonation is really fast but it can't leave, it can't form that carbocation. So it has to wait around for this conjugate base to remove our proton on the beta carbon. So it's an E2 mechanism and kicking out our alkene and our regenerating our acid. Okay. So this is not exactly the same as what we were doing, but it generates the same product. It generates alkenes, okay? Okay. So one of the issues with these primary is if you're waiting for a base to come in, what if it's not the conjugate base you started with? What if, the, what if your alcohol that's also in there that you were meaning to dehydrate also reacted as a nucleophile instead? So what we're having here is in this case here, we formed our oxonium cation right here. But now we're using our lone pair from our alcohol as a nucleophile. It's a poor nucleophile. So it's gonna do a substitution reaction. It's gonna do an SN2 reaction and have give us this protonated oxygen species. And then when the base comes in and removes the proton, we now have an ether instead of an alkene. Okay, so this, this is in competition with this substitution reaction. Okay. If we had it as the E1 reaction, it wouldn't be in competition, but we have this as our E2 reaction, okay? So for uh, things, especially primary alcohols, because those do the E2 reaction, they are susceptible to both mostly elimination, but some substitution. Yes? Um, if this is a weak nucleophile, why is it? 
Uh, it's well because it actually uh, we can't form a carbocation, so it has to be a bi bi molecular reaction. If you don't form a carbocation, it must be bi molecular, and that's bi molecular elimination or bi molecular substitution. Okay. 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 So that leads to a problem is if you have your secondary and tertiary alcohols that form carbocations, you can get rearrangements. But the primary alcohols don't undergo that because there is uh, no way to form a, uh, our, our first primary alcohol, our primary carbocation. Okay. So then what we can see here is in this case, um, let's see. Car no carbocation rearrangement. An alkene can attack the forming carbocation. No, no, I'm skipping that. Okay. All right. So now let's switch gears a little bit. <clears throat> okay. We said we can make um, acetylenes, uh, alkynes, using a either a geminal dihalide and two equivalents of ACE very strong base, sodium amide, and or using vicinal dihalides and using, again, very strong base. In this case, we're using t-butoxide, okay? So uh, what we can see here is that we can make these in, in a bunch of different ways. Right here. But there's another way to generate these uh, geminal dihalides. So the way to generate these general, general dihalides is to use phosphorus pentachloride. It's phosphorus five, with five chlorine bonds. Notice that has 10 electrons around it, okay? So it's, it's the one of the ones that can break that. What it's gonna do is phosphorus is oxophilic. It really loves being bonded to oxygen. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna kick off two of these chlorines and attack and, and take that oxygen away. And so the chlorines are gonna end up on that carbon. So in this case, we're gonna get our geminal dichloride compound right here from a ketone. And then we're going to uh, use excess, looks at three equivalents of the sodium amide to generate our alkyne. So this is another way to form that. But the more interesting reaction we have with the acetylene is using it as a nucleophile, right? If we looked at the acidity of our our hydrocarbons, you know, the proton on the acetylene is the most acidic hydrocarbon, PK25, okay? We can use that at our advantage because guess what? Sodium amide is strong enough to deprotonate acetylene. And if we can use that, we can deprotonate this acetylene, what do we have? A negative charge, a full negative charge. We have a good nucleophile. And so we can use it as a nucleophile to make new carbon-carbon bonds, okay? So imagine we started with something that only has two carbons, acetylene, and we can build it to any size we want by using the reaction of pulling that proton off and using it as a nucleophile, okay? So if we do that, we can make anything from an alkyl halide and do an SN2 reaction, and we can make any size hydrocarbon chain we want. Okay, so in this case here, we're going to take the acetylide ion and we're going to attack this methyl chloride. And what we end up with is three carbons long. We started with two carbons, we're now three carbons long. We've built something. Okay, we've extended our chain, but you know, we still have another hydrogen here. I bet we could deprotonate that side and add it to something else. So let's put an ethyl group on the other side. So now we have five carbons here. So just by changing out the alkyl halide you're using, the primary alkyl halide, you can make it 10, 20, 30 long, but you're still gonna have this acetylene, this alkyne here in the middle, okay? Which you can find useful, okay? Now with secondaries and tertiaries, it acts as a base. It's too big to come in and act as that. Think about how strong a base it is because we had to use sodium amide to deprotonate it. So it acts as a base. So we'll see elimination products. We'll actually see E2 elimination products in secondaries and tertiary. But primary alkyl halides, you get carbon-carbon chain growth right there. Okay, <clears throat> questions on that? 
So we're going to see using that a satellite ion as an input file a lot. Yes. So the satellite as a satellite, um, it was SM2 because is it you have to have you can't have it be a strong nuclear yeah. and strong base. So it, it is a strong nuclear file and a strong base, but this is a primary. So the substitution uh, reaction is faster. And this is a primary also, so the substitution reaction is faster. Here, the substitution reaction is slower, and now it takes on the equilibrium reaction, which is the base reaction. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's like the strongest indication of what it's like. Is the primary stuff first? There's like an order yeah. of it, right? Yes. And then solvent is like the last. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, nature of the nucleophile or base, nature of the substrate. Those are the top two. Okay, so now we've made double bonds and we've made triple bonds now. So how do we get them? What reactions do they do? So let's do a reaction with them. The first reaction I want to talk about is catalytic hydrogenation. Okay, so catalytic hydrogenation means we have to get hydrogen and add it across that double bond. Okay, so we have to use a metal catalyst because hydrogen hydrogen bond is a nonpolar bond. Okay. So because it's nonpolar, there's nothing to help us, you know, shove that alkene in there. So we have to activate that bond. And so we use this with a, usually a metal. <clears throat> it's usually palladium, platinum, or nickel. You'll see that with hydrogen over it. And then usually heat or sometimes pressure, like bar, uh, 20 bar, whatever. But what happens here is you have this uh, hydrogen uh, is going to add across the double bond, giving us a saturated hydrocarbon. And it'll even give, it'll add across double bonds even when they're very crowded, like this uh, four, four substituted alkene. But notice the hydrogens add on the exact same side. That's because of the mechanism. Okay. So let's look at the mechanism right here. So what has to happen is our hydrogen has to first react with the surface of the metal. And so then it's going to make a hydrogen metal bond. That's a very polar bond, right? And so, because the hydrogen hydrogen bond is nonpolar, the hydrogen metal bond is polar. So we're going to have our alkene, and it's going to come down with its pi cloud and come down and get close to the surface. And one of the p orbitals is going to pick up a hydrogen right here. The other p orbital is going to pick up a hydrogen here. And we're going to end up breaking our alkene and turning into an alkane. Okay. But do you see why they add on the same side? We call this cis addition because they're adding on the same side of the double bond, cis addition, okay? So the net result is we got rid of a pi, uh, or we got rid of a pi bond and made two sigma bonds. And as we know from our catalytic hydrogenation, study of heats of hydrogenation, the hydrocarbon is more stable than the alkene. So this gives off heat. And how much heat depends on how substituted it is or not substituted it as it is. Okay, so there is a rate associated with this. Uh, one thing is that number one, the more substituted uh, alkenes are more stable. So they're less reactive. That's one reason they're slow. The unsubstituted one only has one group. There's only one group kind of blocking it from coming down and touching the surface. So you have one group trying to, you know, you have to finagle to get down there to get the two hydrogens to add. And then two groups, it gets harder, three groups, four groups. It just gets harder and harder to get them there. But also the most reactive is also the least stable. So it's more, like, more willing to react. If you remember either one of those, that will, both of those arguments will work for this. Okay. So we'll always see those monosubstituted react faster than trying tetrasubstituted. Okay. But what about alkynes? Well, let's see. I have an alkyne. It has two pi bonds. I can use catalytic hydrogenation to reduce down an alkene. I thought I can use that to reduce down an alkyne. Okay. So I'm gonna, I want to stop it at the alkene. Wait a minute. I have an alkyne that's going to be hydrogenated down to an alkene first. But then it's an alkene, and I know catalytic hydrogenation can reduce alkenes. So you can't stop at the alkene in catalytic hydrogenation. All you can do is go from the alkyne all the way down to the 
alkane. Okay, it won't stop. It's just too reactive. So what we have to do is we have to cheat. We have to take that catalytic hydrogenation and make it less reactive. So we're going to make it less reactive by poisoning the catalyst. Okay, and when we do that, we call that Lindler's catalyst. And Lindler's catalyst gives us only cis alkenes because your alkyne is still coming onto the surface and we're still adding the two hydrogens to those two pi orbitals. So they have to add cis. So you always get the cis alkene, okay? But now we also have a way to get the trans alkene and it goes by a completely different mechanism to get the anti. Okay, so let's look at that cis alkene with that syn addition, okay? So the cis alkene, we usually take our platinum, palladium, or whatever, and we poison it with lead. By poisoning it with lead, it makes it less reactive. So it's reactive enough to go with the alkyne, but not reactive enough to go with the alkene. Okay? But it's still a poison catalyst. It's still on the surface. So you still have to put your alkene on the surface first, and then it adds the two hydrogens, cis, and, or our syn addition, to give us our cis alkene. Okay, but uh, so yeah, so it'll always give us that cis alkene. So the mechanism is very similar to catalytic hydrogenation. It's just it's less active. Okay. But when we want the trans alkene, we have we can't do it with the catalytic hydrogenation because we can't just add one to the top and add one up here at the top. You know, add one to the bottom and try to add one to the top. So we have to change the mechanism. And in this mechanism, we call it the dissolving metal reduction. You're actually going to take solid sodium or lithium metal, and it's going to do a one electron donation to the alkene to make it into a intermediate. Okay, so let's look at that. So we can use lithium or sodium. And if you look at lithium or sodium on the, on the uh, periodic table, they both have a single valence electron in their S orbital. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our single electron in our metallic, our, our neutral metal here, and we're going to donate it to this pi cloud here, okay? Because it's this is less electrophilic than this, and so it's going to donate that electron to the carbon. When it does that, it changes hybridization. It goes from sp to sp2. One of those hybrid orbitals has one electron in it, and we call that a radical. The other electron, the other orbital has two electrons on it and a negative charge. So that's obviously the anion. So we have a radical anion, okay. So this anion here is very basic. And so what it does is it pulls a protein, proton off of the solvent. In this case, it's ammonia. So ammonia is a protic solvent and so it can be transferred. So that gives us a vinyl radical. Okay, well, we're not quite done. If you have another equivalent of lithium, it can donate one electron. Notice there's only one barb on this, on this, uh, uh, on this arrow here. When it donates that uh, electron, we get a radical, uh, I mean, we get the anion. And notice this anion is trans to the hydrogen that's already added, okay? Because when we do our first formation of our radical anion, we want the two largest groups to be trans to each other. So the two, the two orbitals that we're starting to fill are trans to each other. So we've added one to a hydrogen here. So now once we get the anion, it acts as a base, removes something from the solvent, and we get to the trans alkene. Okay, dissolving metal reduction, single electron reconfiguration gives us the trans isomer. Okay, so now we can make hydrocarbons from alkynes, Palladium and carbon. We can make um, alkenes, cis alkenes, by using Lindler's catalyst, poison catalyst. Or we can make trans alkenes by dissolving metal reduction. So that's a lot of different things. In fact, when we get back from our exam next Monday, we're going to start our reaction tables. So that'll help us keep all of these reactions in mind. Okay. And I'm actually going to do this retrosynthesis thing next time as well. So now I want to finish up with our review for all the chapters. Okay. Now you can find this on Canvas. 
but I'm going to explain what I mean by each of these topics here. Uh, on chapter five, stereochemistry, R, S, and priority rules. And you'll need those priority rules for E and Z as well. So know how to do stereo drawings, Newman projections, and Fisher projections. There will be questions on each of those in the exam. Know the definitions of enantiomers, diastereomers, and meso. Okay, this is actually on Canvas, so you don't have to write it all down. Just with, if I say something in addition to that. Okay. It's under it's under resources, and it's called um, um, Chem 2130 uh, Exam Two Review Chapters Five Through Seven. Look for Chapter Five Through Seven Review. I don't see it. Yeah, see email it. me. <laughs> so. You can't see my folder for some reason. Uh, know, what a, know the difference between chiral and achiral. Racemic mixtures and rotation of light. Specifically, if, it, if the pure isomer rotates at one direction, it's equal and opposite the other direction. And if they're mixed, they cancel out. Okay. Uh, in, SN, in, in chapter six, we focus on SN1 and SN2. And that's alkyl halides by name and type. We need to be able to name our alkenes, our, al our dienes, our, our alkyl halides, okay? Look back at chapter two. We named them there, but we need to name them again, okay? Uh, look at the definition of nucleophile, electrophile, base, and leading group, okay? Those are the things on our charts so that we want to be looking. Uh, know the rate laws for SN1, SN2, E1, E2 the mechanisms and reaction diagrams, okay? So those that's only two basically things to remember there. No polar protic and polar aprotic solvents, including like what their names might be, like THF, DMF, uh, water. I know the difference between exothermic and endothermic. Uh, know the stereochemistry difference between SN1 and SN2. SN2 is immersion. SN1 is racemic. Uh, carbocation shape and stability. Carbocation rearrangements. We only have three. One, two hydride transfer, one, two methyl transfer, and ring expansion. Don't forget ring expansion. Uh, solvent effects. Polar products promote substitution reactions, bimolecular reactions. Polar product produce promote carbocations, carbocations. Functional groups that can be made from different nucleophiles. That was that one chart in the book that you can make like 10 different functional groups all the same way. And one of those was using the acetylide ion as a nucleophile, by the way. Ha ha ha. Okay, chapter seven, last chapter. Identify E and Z in priority rules, uh, alkene stability trends, you know, more substituted, more stable. Uh, E1 and E2 rate laws, mechanism reaction diagrams. You should know them from the SN1 and SN2 anyway. Uh, identifying beta hydrogens. Identifying all your beta hydrogens and making sure you're choosing the right one. Okay. Uh, hydrogenation and heats of hydrogenation. So that's that catalytic hydrogenation and uh, how to make cis and trans alkenes. Zaitsev's rule, conjugation rule, and Hoffman rule. Okay, conjugation rule, if you, have, if you have a double bond, you want to conjugate it. If you have a small base, you want to get the more substituted. If you have a big bulky base, you might end up with the Hoffman rule, less substituted. Okay, compare and contrast E1, E2, SN1, SN2. Get that practice table. I put an empty one on Canvas under resources again, and <laughs> fill it out and convince yourself why each of those boxes it should be an E2, or an SN2 or an E1. Okay, uh, nature of the nucleophile base. If it's a good nucleophile, it's probably gonna go SN2. If it's a good base, it's probably gonna go E2. But if it's a poor base or a poor uh, nucleophile, it's gonna probably make a carbocation compete. Um, know that you can influence your elimination reactions by running them hot to make them eliminate and cold to make them substitute. So you can get SN2 competing with E2 
if you have a small nucleophilic base and you run it cold, you're going to get more substitution. If you run it hot, you're going to get more elimination. Uh, nature of the substrate, know what primary, secondary, and tertiary, which reactions they do. Remember the, the dehydration of the alcohol, it went through a different mechanism because it couldn't form the carbon cation. Um, nature of solvent, which we already did. Uh, making alkynes using geminal and vicinal dihalides using sodium amide to make alkynes. Uh, reactions of alkynes, including reduction and uh, using the acetylene as a nucleophile. And then know the reductions are, you can get catalytic hydrogenation, which all the way down to hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrocarbon. Poison catalyst, linear catalyst gets you to cis alkenes and dissolving metal gets you into trans alkenes. So yeah, use that image in your head. You know, so that is the list there. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. All right. Um, so I'll see you on Monday for the exam. And then on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, we'll start with our reaction tables in chapter eight. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. Any questions from the online crew? We're down to seven already, so I guess not. Okay. I'm going to stop recording.